Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about action preparation and how task characteristics affect action preparation. Um, so first, what we mean by action preparation is we're talking about basically the processing time that has to take place uh, in preparation for an action. So it's the time interval that takes place uh, from the time of making the decision to act until the action actually begins. Um, so <clears throat> it's not the long term preparation in terms of the days or weeks that lead up to it, because that's a different type of preparation like training and practice. Um, so we're not referring to that, but we're talking about the very specific short interval of time that happens immediately prior to initiating a movement. Um, so in past videos, I have mentioned and discussed reaction time. Um, so I want to clarify that here with action preparation. Uh, so reaction time is the time between the onset of a go signal, so like a stimulus to act, and that's the point where the decision is made to, to take the action. Um, and so it's the interval between the go signal and the actual beginning of the movement. Um, it's during that reaction time that action preparation is taking place. Um, so it's like reaction time is the interval of time and action preparation is the activity that's taking place during the reaction time. Uh, so they're not synonymous, but they're happening at the same time. Uh, reaction time depends on the amount of preparation needed to produce an action. Um, so the more complex it is or the greater demand for accuracy um, or depending on the, the demands and the needs of that action, um, there will be a longer or shorter reaction time to accommodate for the more or less uh, action preparation that's required. Um, that interval is also referred to as a response delay interval. All right, so response choices really affect the amount of processing or the amount of preparation that has to take place to prepare for that action. Um, so the number of response choices, uh, as the number of choices increases, the amount of time required to prepare increases. Um, so as there are more stimuli, more potential go signals, uh, and more responses to those signals, uh, that means that there are more choices to make and that increases the amount of time required for action preparation. So that increases the length of time and the reaction time. Um, Hicks law says that reaction time increases logarithmically as the number of stimulus response choices increases. Um, so what I mean here is like if we had a bunch of different colored lights on the wall and when the red light goes, you push this button. When the blue light goes, you push this button. So there are multiple stimuli, different colors of lights and different responses, you know, pushing different buttons that you need to uh, respond with um, in response to those stimuli. So as the number of choices increases, so does the reaction time. Uh, the predictability of the correct response choice. So as it becomes more and more predictable that one of the choices uh, is going to be the right one. So as you, the person becomes better able to predict what is the correct response, the amount of time required to prepare decreases. Um, now, the predictability, how they're predicting may or may not be accurate. So they may be predicting like there's an 80% chance it's going to be the blue light. So they might be really fast to press the correct button for the blue light because 80% of the time that will be true. But when there's 20% of the time that it's not blue, they're going to be much more prone to error. Um, and then also the reaction time, the action um, preparation is going to take a lot longer when it's not blue because that bias towards the blue light is going to send them in that direction. Um, so it, they'll have longer than if there was 50-50 odds. Uh, it'll take longer to choose the correct response when it's the yellow light, for example. Um, but if they are correctly predicting the response choice, um, the reaction time and the preparation is reduced when they can reliably predict distance, direction, speed, and so on. Uh, but that only applies as long as the person's attention and focus is maintained on the task. Um, so if, like, let's say their mind wanders off or they're distracted by some other sound, they have lost that advantage in terms of predicting the correct response choice, and they're kind of back to square one where every response choice is treated equally. 
uh, the stimulus response compatibility. Um, the idea here is that if the response that is required after a stimulus matches the stimulus, then it will require less preparation and less time to prepare that action. Um, so like spatially, a good example of that is with the lights that I just described. Let's say the lights are arranged horizontally and the button that is the response for each light is located just below each light. Well, that's compatible, that's spatially compatible. So that if the blue light goes off, I push the button by the blue light. If the red light goes off, I push the button by the red light. So that's compatible, uh, which is gonna reduce the reaction time. It's gonna reduce the amount of action preparation required. Whereas let's say the lights are arranged vertically and the buttons are arranged horizontally, and so the blue light goes off and I have to take a little bit more time to make sure I'm choosing the correct button. Um, so in that case, the stimulus and response are not very compatible. Okay, let's see. All right, the Stroop effect is an example of a stimulus response compatibility problem. Um, so it's the appearance of the stimulus suggests one type of response but the situation requires a different response. So the example here uh, is if, you may have seen this, these get passed around the internet a little bit, uh, but it's a person must verbally respond to the ink color of a word that names a color. Um, so we're gonna be able to say the correct color when the color is compatible, when the ink is compatible with the word that it says, but it takes a little bit longer. We have to think about it more uh, when we're trying to say the color of the ink and it's not compatible with what the word says. So like the word blue written in blue or the word red written in green, those take different amounts of processing time because that's an example where the stimulus and the response are not compatible. They don't agree. Okay, the four period. Uh, so the four period is the interval of time between a warning signal and the stimulus or go signal. So up until now, we've been talking about the go signal until the beginning of the action. The four period takes place before the go signal and it's some kind of warning. Um, like if you're gonna start a race and you get on your mark, get set, go, that on your mark, get set is, giving you a warning signal that the go signal is about to take place. So that's the four period. Um, so in simple reaction time situations, if the four period is a constant length for each trial, then the reaction time is shorter than if there's variation. So like if there's variability, like if for each race or each trial, um, somebody is giving a warning signal with a variable length of four period before the go signal, then it's not predictable. When the go signal is gonna come can't be predicted as well uh, because it's variable. Uh, but when the four period is a constant length, like it's always three seconds long or however long it might be, uh, then that gives the person the opportunity to anticipate and predict when that go signal is going to come. Um, and so a lot of the action preparation can take place during the four period, which will significantly decrease reaction time after the go signal. Uh, complexity, accuracy, and rep uh, repetition. So um, as the movement becomes more complex, the person is going to require more uh, preparation. So reaction time increases as a function of the number of component parts of the required action. Okay, so as the complexity of the action increases, so that could be the number of limbs moving and number of segments moving, that could be the number of components in the movement, the length of time, the duration of the movement. Uh, there's many ways that a movement can increase in complexity, but the more complex it is, the greater amount of action preparation is required. Um, same for accuracy. The more accuracy that is required, the more time it will take for, to prepare that action. Um, it's very similar to the speed accuracy trade-off that I discussed in a previous video. Um, and so here it's, it's the same trade-off, but now we're talking about in terms of preparation before the movement occurs. So um, not only as accuracy needs to increase, speed decreases to accommodate that accuracy, but that also carries over to the reaction time. 
Um, and then repetition, the more we are carrying out the same response in response to a stimulus, the faster the reaction time becomes for the next attempt. Uh, time between responses. So how fast we are able to respond and how much action preparation is required um, will depend also on how far apart the two signals are spaced, like the two go signals. So essentially, we can't respond to the second go signal until our response to the first go signal is complete. So if they happen too close together, then the response to the second go signal will be slower than it was for the first one, because we have to wait to kind of carry out that first response, and then we're able to carry out the second. That's kind of the idea, like in basketball, when you fake out your opponent, you're getting a response, like you're giving a stimulus by faking out in one direction, and they're responding to that stimulus. And then if you quickly move in the other direction, they're gonna be slower to respond to that stimulus and to follow in the correct direction that you're actually planning to move. They're gonna be slower because they're still processing and responding to that first stimulus. So that's really what we mean here. All right, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.